If you've ever worked on a project for more than a couple of weeks, you've likely experienced a phenomenon known as technical debt. Technical debt is the implied cost of additional rework that's caused by choosing an easy or limited solution instead of using a better approach that would take longer. In other words, it's the time, money, and effort that's required to rework a project that's being held back by lower quality code. The term has a bit of a negative connotation because it sort of implies that developers should know better and generally have the power to avoid it. But in my experience, that isn't always the case. Factors like tight deadlines, inexperience with certain technologies, and a poorly defined scope can all play a role in producing technical debt that must be repaid. However, one common cause that is in your control is delayed refactoring. Refactoring is a controlled technique for improving the design of an existing code base. Its purpose is to improve the design, structure, and or implementation of your code while preserving its functionality. In many cases, delaying the refactoring of certain aspects of your code will almost certainly lead to technical debt. But like most things in software development, it isn't as simple as it sounds. Refactoring in itself is a skill that can take years of experience to perfect. When I first started refactoring, I'd mostly end up breaking my own code. And I'd honestly get really frustrated and pretty overwhelmed by the process. But practice makes perfect. And luckily, over the years, I picked up a couple of guidelines that really helped me to improve. One in particular is framing my refactoring sessions around a single goal. For example, you could refactor for scalability by focusing on decoupling tightly coupled code or you could refactor for testability by focusing solely on externalizing your class's dependencies so they could be injected with mocks. But in my opinion, the most important approach you could take is to refactor your code for readability. Because at the end of the day, programming languages were designed for humans. And one of the easiest things you could do to get the most value out of your programming is to write code that's easy to read and communicates your intent effectively. So in this video, I'm going to share a few tips that you can use to refactor your own code for readability. But first, if you want more content just like this, sign up for my Level 2 Game Dev newsletter. Level 2 is all about helping you develop the skills needed to take your game dev hobby or career to the next level. Once a month, we'll send you a curated list of content that'll help you take the next step on your game dev journey. If you're interested, visit the link in the description to sign up now. All right, let's learn some tips to refactor your code for readability. To help us run through these tips, we're gonna use some user submitted code that Jason Story and I reviewed during a live stream back in 2020. Big shout out and a thank you to Direxy for their submission. It isn't easy to put yourself out there and I wanna be clear that there's nothing functionally wrong with this code. The code consists of a mono behavior that represents a single Jenga piece. If you've never played Jenga before, it's a game where players take turns removing one block at a time from a tower that's constructed of 54 blocks. The goal is to try to place your blocks at the top of the tower without knocking it down. This code is a good example of why it can be difficult to approach refactoring, because there are a number of ways that we can rewrite this logic. That's why for this refactoring session, we're only gonna focus on improving the script's readability and we're gonna take it step by step so you can use the chapter markers below to skip around or easily rewatch any section that you'd like to review in the future. Let's get started. My first tip for improving the readability of your code is consistency. Reading someone else's code or even your own code from a couple of weeks ago is hard enough as it is. But when that code doesn't have consistent indentations, naming conventions, and overall code styling, your brain has to work harder to understand its contents. And the intent of the programmer who wrote it can sometimes get lost. Imagine reading a book where each page used multiple font families, paragraph sizes, and margins. It would be a nightmare to read, and you'd probably never finish it. So let's jump into the code and clean up some of the inconsistencies in our Jenga piece class. For example, the indentation of lines 25 through 35 is inconsistent with the rest of the script. So let's fix that. And the bracket position and spacing of the if else statements in the same section don't follow the standards set out by the rest of the script either. 
The same can be said for a few of these functions found below. Let's clean those up too. Looking better already, but consistency shouldn't end with a single class. I've worked on plenty of projects where each developer wrote their code in the style that they were most comfortable with, but that approach produces a code base that is disjointed and really hard to work with. You never can tell what you're gonna get the first time you look at a script. That's why it's important to follow the coding practices of whatever team you're working with so the entire project follows the same styling. It's not about being right or wrong, but rather about building a code base that's predictable and comfortable to read once you get used to its flavor of styling. To illustrate this, we're gonna pretend that I am the lead developer on this project, which would make me responsible for determining the styling. As such, I'm going to explicitly add the private keyword to each private variable and method in the class. I like this example because whether or not you choose to add the private keyword is completely subjective. In fact, Jason Story prefers leaving it out. So this is a case where he'd have to compromise on his own standard styling for the sake of the project. Great, looks good to me. It should come as no surprise that every developer has their own opinion about how you should style your code. When enough developers can agree on a particular style, a convention is born. Microsoft has its own c -sharp convention that you can find on the official documentation. It describes everything from how you should name public versus private variables to what format you should use when leaving comments. Of course, you don't have to follow Microsoft's conventions just because they created the language. In fact, many development teams create their own conventions that you can typically find as a style guide that's outlined in the readme files of their project's repositories. That being said, if your goal is to empower as many developers as possible to help you complete your project, I'd recommend going with Microsoft's conventions as they're definitely the most widely used. So let's refactor some of those conventions into our Jenga piece class now. The first convention we'll address is naming. In terms of class members, i.e. fields, properties, and methods, the rule of thumb is to use Pascal case when members are public and camel case with a leading underscore when they're private. So let's do that now. One additional convention that's specific to Unity is that properties which are exposed in the Unity editor should use camel case. I'm still on the fence about whether or not I like it, so I've been trying it out in my personal projects. It's already starting to grow on me. The next convention we'll address is implicitly typed local variables. Basically, if the type of the variable is obvious from the right side of the assignment, just use var. There are plenty of other conventions, but those are the only two that needed to be refactored into this script. Before we move on though, you may have noticed that I used some shortcuts that were built into my code editor to complete the refactor. That's because my IDE, as well as a few third-party plugins that you can download, can suggest and automate code styling changes for you. You can customize them to fit your needs, but most, if not all of them, adhere to Microsoft's official c -sharp conventions out of the box. It just makes the whole process that much easier. Up until now, our refactoring process has been pretty straightforward. It's essentially been a cleanup job. But this next tip is a little more subjective. Whenever possible, you want to bake your intent right into your code. In my experience, the easiest code to work with is code that reads almost like a summary. It reveals exactly what the developer intended it to do in a very human readable way. Looking at the update method of the Jenga piece class, we can see a taste of what I'm talking about. Let's try to read out the if statement on line 24 as a summary of what it does. If the Jenga piece should assemble, then do a bunch of other stuff. Otherwise, don't do anything. That is what this if statement is currently communicating to me. But what is this other stuff that needs to happen if the Jenga piece should assemble? Well, I've already spent the time reading through it, so I'll spare you having to figure it out. All of this logic is responsible for moving the Jenga piece to its starting position. We can improve the readability by extracting the logic into a method that describes this intent. There. Now we can read this logic as, if the Jenga piece should assemble, move it to the starting position. Much better. 
Extracting whole chunks of logic into separate methods is one approach, but there are even simpler actions that you can take to make your code more human readable. For instance, the enable physics method is a coroutine, but that isn't clear without really looking at the logic. Because of this, it'd be easy for me to think that I could just call this method without passing it into a start coroutine method, and that would lead to unexpected behavior. Let's clear that up by renaming it to enable physics coroutine. Of course, my name choice is subjective. Jason Story prefers to prepend his coroutines with the prefix CO and an underscore. The important thing here is that both names make it very clear that this is a coroutine. The other thing that isn't clear is what unit the duration parameter is expected to be passed as. By reading the code, we know that it's seconds, but another developer may assume that it's milliseconds, which again would lead to unexpected behavior. So let's rename duration to duration in seconds. Great, I'm happy with that. One final example of baking your intent into your code can be found down here in the random forest vector method. It's responsible for generating a random vector based on a bound that can be passed in as a set of parameters. What makes this method difficult to read is the inlining of the x, y, and z values in the creation of the return vector. Now, you could certainly reformat this to improve its readability, but I often prefer creating local variables that explicitly describe what each inline value actually represents. This example could go either way, but there are plenty of times where creating a well-named local variable is absolutely the better option. But I wouldn't fault you for just tidying up the formatting in this particular scenario. My final tip for improving the readability of your code is to cut out any and all fat. In other words, if you don't need it and it doesn't provide any value, get rid of it. The first example of this in the Django Piece class is the keyword this. The this keyword refers to the current instance of the class, and it's always present whether you reference it or not. There are times when using it is necessary, but I generally only use it when I have to, simply because I believe that less is more. So let's get rid of all references to this. My next example will probably be a little controversial. Whenever possible, which is most of the time, I remove comments. If you follow my previous tip and bake your intent into your code, you'll never need comments to explain what it's doing. Again, there are a few cases where comments are useful, but I won't be covering those cases in this video. If you'd like to learn more about writing code that's self-documenting, check out one of my older style videos on the topic here. Also, I know that these summary comments can be used to auto-generate documentation, but this Jenga piece class isn't a part of a library, and I'll never need to include it in any user-facing documentation. So away they go. One more way to cut the fat out of your code is to identify and remove logic that belongs somewhere else. For example, this random force vector method has nothing to do with Jenga, so we can safely move it to a static helper class. Why don't we do that now? There, much better. There are plenty more ways that we could continue to refactor this logic, but having just focused on improving its readability, I'd say we made a lot of progress. I feel confident that I could step away from this code for a couple of weeks and still have a pretty good idea of what it does the next time I looked at it. If you'd like to take a closer look at this code yourself, I've made it available to my tier two patrons who can download it using the link in the description. Don't forget to sign up for my level two game dev newsletter. And if you like this video, please like it, leave a comment and subscribe. Thanks for watching. And as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you to all of my patrons, and a special shout out to Nicholas Monter, Datuo, Jennifer Irwin, Urizer, Alan Caravilla, Umit Sarin, Dustin, Petrio Bungo, and Usif Ali Castle. Thank you so much for your support.